Oh, okay, let's get started. Um, so welcome to uh, sadly the last of Tim's lectures on inverse Galois theory. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, thank you, Akshay. So to remind you uh, where we stand, um, I started to talk a little bit about the group SL2F3. Uh, the reason for that is I mean, there are a couple of reasons. It's the smallest uh, group, which is not semi-abelian. Um, and that makes it interesting because we haven't so far got any constructions how to get its families. Uh, and uh, so this is an example of a group which is in fact an extension uh, of uh, Q8, uh, of, sorry, of C3 by Q8. Um, but in this case, you see this group is non-abelian here. Uh, and so uh, our theorem doesn't apply. So what we're going to prove that in this case, actually the embedding problem is soluble and you can extend every C3 uh, field, putting it inside into an SL2F3 field. So I finished last lecture by just uh, writing down the list of subgroups of SL2F3, which are relevant. So it misses two subgroups that we don't care about, uh, but it, it has the whole power for Q8, and then going up to SL2F3. And by Galois correspondence, it gives uh, us an indication of what we're going to try to do. We'll start with uh, uh, any cubic extension, any, depending on what this field is, think of it as a Q, so cubic extension of Q, or maybe Q of T, so then it's a family then. And then we would like to comp compute a quaternion extension on top, on top of that, which um, on which C3 acts uh, like it acts on Q8 naturally as automorphisms, by permuting ij and k cyclically. So this is what we're going to uh, try to do. Uh, and for that, um, we're not quite going, I mean, we, in theory, we know everything about Q8 extensions now, we have a theorem due to wit, but there is a slightly different characterization of quaternion extensions. A lot of people sort of were interested in quaternion extensions, um, which even goes earlier than wit. It's a theorem of Bucht from 1910, which is essentially equivalent to what Witt has done in this case. And what he proves is the following, that if you have a biquadratic extension of some, of some field, so let me call it capital K because that will be like in my diagram. Uh, and then uh, I would like to compute a quaternion extension on top of it. So I start with a biquadratic and I ask, can I embed it into a quaternion extension? Okay. Biquadratics are easy, take two elements and adjoin their square roots, but quaternion extensions are harder. So, uh, and here, because this problem is abstracted, if you remember, and in this case, what he showed is that um, such an, a biquadratic is embeddable in a quaternion extension if and only if this u and v are up to squares in k. So squares in k obviously don't change which quadratic you, you get, um, but up to squares in k, a u and v have the following sort of funny form. Um, there exist alpha, beta, and gamma in k, such that u is one plus alpha squared plus alpha squared beta squared. Uh, times the same thing, but shifted, uh, where you permute cyclically alpha, beta, gamma. Similarly for V, when you shift this whole construction a bit further. And uh, if you multiply these two together, you'll also see that uh, one of these terms, maybe this one, becomes a square. So you can absorb it into square and K. So the expression for UV, it's also very symmetric in this, uh, in this context. And now, so if you stare at this, uh, well, first of all, uh, I call this big quadratic square root of u and square root of v, but actually it has three quadratic subfields in it, which are quite symmetric, and they're given by square root u, square root v, and square root uv. So these are the three numbers whose square roots I'm adjoining. And you see his construction is very symmetric in uv and w, in a sense that if, you know, it respects this, this C3 symmetry. If uh, I take this alpha, beta, and gamma, in such a way that they're invariant, uh, that C3 permutes them cyclically, it will permute these three guys cyclically. And that's exactly what we want, because we want not just any quaternion extension of on top of a C3, it will give us a large risk product, but the one which respects the C3 action. So, uh, and this, now with, with this, it's very easy, both sort of in practice and in theory now to construct SL2 of three extensions. So this is how we, we go about it. We take now, uh, as I said, where we're essentially solving an embedding problem. So take any C3 extension, let's say of Q, and then you later put it in a family. So take any cubic Galois extension of the rational, which is going to the bottom of our diagram. So maybe let me go back for a second. Uh, so recall 
that again in SL203, quaternions are an index two subgroup, and then inside there are three subgroups of index two permuted by C3, uh, and then um, there's a center and then this whole thing, and then identity. And the corresponding tower of fields is that we started with the cubic extension of little k, uh, and then we're going to construct three quadratic extensions, which are permuted by C3. So what we're going to do, we take alpha to be, well, basically anything you want. So take it to be a general enough element of k. I'll comment on this in a second. Sort of like when we constructed cyclic families and so on, when we said, well, take a general element of q zeta n and then apply this construction. So let's take alpha to be uh, a general element in this cubic extension of q. And now everything is fixed because uh, what I would like to do, I would like to have these three quadratics permuted by gamma. So I would like uh, alpha, beta, and gamma to be permuted by gamma. So I'm going to let uh, the gamma group of C3, so sorry, the gamma group of K over Q, the cyclic group of order three, let's pick a generator called G. I'm going to hit alpha with G, I get beta in K, uh, hit it again by G, you get gamma in K. So alpha, beta, gamma would be three elements in this field, which are permuted by this C3 downstairs. Okay, this gives us alpha, beta, gamma. Then we divide, define U, V, and W by this formula. Uh, and uh, by his criterion now, uh, this, by, this extension is first of all embedded into a quaternion extension. And secondly, everything is so symmetric that it's not hard. And the quaternion extensions, if you recall from Witt's theorem, are essentially unique. Uh, that it forces uh, the whole thing to be Galois over Q with Galois group SL2 of three. In fact, because Wit is very explicit, it tells you what is the extension that you get. You can unravel it, and then you find that the SL2 of three, SL2 of three extension that we're after is given by this very nice, very symmetric, explicit formula. It's K adjoin root U root V, so that's a biquadratic. And then after that, um, the, to get the quaternion thing on top, we are joined square root of this expression, which is, you see, again, symmetric in U, V, and W. Uh, so the only thing is that if you do this theoretically, we haven't quite solved an embedding problem yet, because it could be, you know, that something goes terribly wrong and there are no such thing as general enough elements of K for this to work. So, for example, for some reason, you always get smaller extensions that all these elements, for example, for some reason, if you take them in S3 extension, could be, I don't know, a square. So this, this tower on top uh, that we've constructed is going to be trivial. So uh, you have to do a little bit of work to prove that this is not the case and these things exist, no matter what a little uh, capital K over little K is, but it's not terribly hard. And um, there is a, um, theorem, which I think Fadeev was first to prove in 1945. So he proved that this, what I called picking a general enough element of case for this construction to work is always possible. So he showed that over Q or Q of T, or in fact, over any Hilbertian field, uh, this construction works and every C3 extension of little k can be embedded into an SL2 of three extension of little k. In particular, these things exist and they are, um, there are regular families of SL2 of three extensions. So again, this construction is kind of interesting is that it does solve an embedding problem in the case where the kernel is a non-abelian group and it, it works and it works well. And of course, um, you can ask yourself, well, like when does this work? Can you generalize it to other groups uh, and semi-direct Q where N is non-abelian? In other words, suppose I have a family which has a Galois group Q over some field Q or Q of T or some Hilbertian field, whatever, and I want to extend it to a family. Um, I want to put it inside a larger group which has the following shape and semi-direct Q, where N is an arbitrary group. For which N and Q you can do this. Uh, if you could do this, at least soluble groups, I think you could get very far with, um, uh, with, with this process. Uh, this is not known. Uh, well, in fact, um, it is not known for which class of groups uh, it is possible, but there's a big conjecture uh, by the Bayer Deschamps that say that it's always possible. So the conjecture says that every, what we've now considered uh, uh, 
the obvious name split embedding problem. So lifting a Q extension to an N semi-direct Q extension for any N and any Q is always possible over any Hilbertian field. Now, of course, it's a difficult conjecture because it's uh, much stronger than the inverse Galois problem. You can take, uh, you know, uh, N can be arbitrary and Q could be trivial. So for example, it says that you can, you can uh, embed any, you know, C1 extension into an extension with an arbitrary group, a Galois group. So uh, this is a very strong statement, but at least it gives you an indication of what we expect to be true. And we're sort of maybe hopeful to find some techniques which, um, which work. And, um, you know, there are some very interesting groups that you could try to play with and see if, um, uh, if you can generalize this construction in some way. So the difficulty here really is that um, what happens here secretly is that, remember again, the quaternion group, it has an auto-automorphism of order three. And here we've got a family or a construction, whatever, of quaternion extensions, which respects this auto-automorphism action. Uh, and this was what make, and this is now what makes it possible to push it further to the two S of two F three extensions. And normally, when you construct a family for some group G, it is not going to be invariant under out automorphisms of G in any way. Um, well, unless maybe you try hard, or I don't know. Uh, so uh, it really raises an obvious question: of how far you can push this? Let me check in the chat if there are any questions. Uh, if no, so I think that's that's all I want to say about this whole embedding problem and finish uh, by talking a little bit about two methods. Uh, we've talked about semi-abelian groups this is, and, split, and the split embedding problems. This is a very nice general method and we know when it applies more or less, uh, except there are conjectures that say that it applies much more generally. But uh, let us look at two other methods, one which is called descent to subgroups and one which is called rigidity, which uh, again, I think have a potential to be pushed further and they would be sort of very interesting, I think, to, to study as, as research problems. So one obvious question, I talked a lot about wreath products, direct products, quotient groups, but uh, well, except for an answer to one of the questions in one of the first lectures, I didn't talk much about subgroups. And there is an obvious question. Uh, suppose you constructed a family which has Galois group uh, U, um, let's say, uh, and then you have a subgroup G in U. And the question is, can you find a subfamily which has this Galois group G? So for example, what Hilbert's construction of, alter, of AN extensions essentially does, it says, let's start with an SN family, such as X to the N plus AX plus B, and then find some specialization. So try to find, let's say, A and B to be rational functions on some variable T, that the discriminant of this thing becomes a square, and the family drops from SN to AN. And you can ask yourself, when is this possible? And again, that's a big question. If this were always possible, you could solve the inverse Galois problem because uh, every group is a subgroup of SN uh, and we know how to construct SN families. So we could, if we could always descend to a subgroup, then you know, we could construct an arbitrary group G. Uh, we don't uh, expect this really. Uh, and as asked like this for, a, for an arbitrary family, this is certainly not true, and you can not always do that. So let us look at an uh, example where you can construct uh, C3 families starting from an S3 family uh, like this by studying this descent problem. And already this case shows very nicely what sort of problems you, uh, you encounter along the way. So again, what I would like to do, well, essentially this is Hilbert's case because this is A3 inside S3, I would like to construct um, families of extensions uh, of cubic Galois extensions, let's say of Q, uh, starting from the fact that I know a lot of S3 extensions because just take an arbitrary cubic and then, well, you've got most likely it's going to be an S3 extension when it's really useful. So let's start with the S3 family, which is built in in the package uh, for no particular reason. It's just a small coefficients. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an obvious family where you take a polynomial x cubed plus x plus a. Right, so again, uh, what I would like to do, I would like to see um, if I think of this as a family of S3 extensions, so I take a to be you know, one, two, three, any rational number, it will give me an extension. 
And the question is, does it sometimes become drop? Does the group sometimes drop to C3? And can you put these uh, exceptions into a family? Well, how do you know whether, when, whether it drops to C3? You have to compute the discriminant and see if the discriminant is a square. Uh, so you compute the discriminant of this cubic up to squares. It's minus 27A4, uh, A squared minus four. And what I'd like to see is that if there are specific rational values for A, or ideally uh, a whole rational function, let's say A of T, such that minus 27A of T squared minus four is equal to a square. And if yes, then, uh, by plugging in instead of A, this subfamily A of T will give me a family now over P1 with the variable T of larger degree possibly, but now it will have the Galois group contained in C3. Now, unfortunately for this particular family, this is clearly impossible because you cannot make this into a square. Minus 27 A squared minus four is very negative. So uh, if you want this to be equal to B squared, uh, this gives you a genus zero curve over the rationals, which doesn't have any rational points because it doesn't have any real points. So there is a local obstruction in this case. And therefore you can forget about this family. It doesn't have any C3 specializations. You might as well sort of throw it away and start over you. So let's do that. Let's take another S3 family, which is X cubed plus AX plus one. So now, um, you know, I let this last coefficient to be one and the a linear term to vary uh, with a. Uh, the discriminant of this is minus uh, four a cubed minus 27. Oops, sorry about this. Uh, this b squared uh, shouldn't be there um, because b is one. Uh, so it should be just minus four a cubed minus 27, like here. And again, you can ask yourself, uh, can this expression be a square sometimes? Uh, so in other words, uh, what happens if I equate this expression to b squared? What's what's a set of rational solutions to this equation look like? Well, if you look at the equation b squared equals minus 4a cubed minus 27, this is what's, what's called an elliptic curve. Um, it's a curve of, of genus one. It may have rational points. So it is quite possible that you can find values for a and b such that this expression here on the right is a square. I didn't check this to be honest. Um, but in any case, what, what we know for sure is that because it's a higher genus curve, it certainly doesn't admit any maps of P1 into it. So you cannot map uh, rationally P1 into an elliptic curve. And therefore, uh, there is no uh, rational function like this A of T, such that minus four A of T cubed minus 27 is always a square. Because this is a non-singular uh, curve of, of genus one. So in other words, using this family here, you may be able to construct C3 extensions over Q. So for example, to solve inverse Galois problem for C3 over Q by just saying, well, let's take A to be this number, then this thing just happens to drop to C3 in Galois group, but you cannot solve the inverse Galois problem of Q of T with it. And um, what you find out if you play with this in practice, a lot of families that, um, that are built in, for example, in the package, uh, if you do this, so you uh, take a family for a specific group and let you say, for instance, what happens if I try to go to a, a try to descend to a quadratic subfield. So this quadratic subfield will be like here, given by an equation, b squared or x squared, if you want, equals some polynomial in A. And sometimes this will be a genus zero curve, which doesn't have rational points. Sometimes it will be a higher genus curve like here. Sometimes you're lucky and it will be a genus zero curve with rational points, but that's not going to happen very often. So there will be very few situations where this descent is going to work for one dimensional families. Yeah, so can you explain again why the discriminant being a square means that there is C3 extension? So generally when you have uh, an S3 extension, so remember what an S3 uh, extension looks like. Um, so S3 is a normal subgroup, which is C3. And that corresponds by Galois theory to a quadratic extension of Q contained inside the splitting field. So when you have, for example, uh, this S3 extension, the quadratic inside it, it's given by the uh, square root of the discriminant of this polynomial. So inside this field here, there is a Q adjoint square root of this. But of course, if this expression is a square, then Q adjoint square root of this becomes a trivial extension. Uh, and in that case, your group 
the Galois group is not S3 anymore. It has to be a smaller group. In fact, it has to be contained in the alternating group A3. So in general, when you have a family, uh, let's say, given by a polynomial of degree n, uh, its Galois group is some, let's say, transitive subgroup of Sn, transitive if the polynomial is irreducible. But if the discriminant of that polynomial is a square, then it is, uh, in fact, contained in the alternating group A. So if you can force a discriminant to be square, you can force your group uh, to drop into the alternating group. And that's what I'm trying to do here, because the alternating group here is just C3. So I'm, I'm really forcing the, um, the discriminant uh, of, of the cubic to be a square. OK, and now, but what happens here is that if you forget for the moment, uh, like I spoke from most of my lectures so far about one dimensional families, about families with just one parameter A, who said we're interested in an inverse Galois problem over Q of T or Q of A. If you allow families with larger number of variables, then suddenly you can push this method much further. And let me illustrate it in this case. Let's take you know, the generic S3 family, X cubed plus AX plus B, where A and B uh, are two parameters. So this now, in fact, covers all S3 extensions of Q. And it's discriminant again. It's given by this formula, uh, minus 4A cubed minus 27B squared. And again, I'm asking myself the same question. Can I make this expression a square? Can I find some uh, substitutions for A and B, some rational functions, which satisfy uh, the property that minus 4 times this rational function cubed minus this rational function squared is always a square. So in other words, I'm interested now in equation c squared equals minus 4a cubed minus 27b squared. And this equation is not a curve anymore, it's a surface, because it's now given by one equation in three variables. And uh, because this uh, equation has de uh, the largest degree you see here is three, is what's called a cubic surface. It's a surface of degree three. And such surfaces, uh, if uh, you're lucky and they have rational points at all, uh, then uh, they're what's called rational. So they are birational to the projective plane. So there is a, a map, uh, which is defined on an open subset of P2 uh, from a projective space with two variables, let's say capital A, capital B, or three variables if you make it homogeneous to our surface S here. Uh, and um, I left a similar exercise. I just put it up on the web for a slightly more interesting groups than S3. But um, various computer algebra systems, including Magma, have a machinery to do that. So you can give it a surface, and you ask, "Is the surface rational?" And if yes, uh, can you give me can you give me a rational parameterization, please? And in this case, what it says it says, "Yeah, sure, the surface is rational, and it can be parameterized as follows: uh, If you take a to be this expression here minus a quarter twenty seven a squared plus b squared, and b equals this, and c equals this, then you take this." polynomials in capital A and capital B, you plug them in and here, you find out that this equation is universally satisfied. So this gives a rational parameterization P2 to S. So this map is more or less an isomorphism in a sense that there are rational functions which give you map the other way, expressing A and B in terms of these things, which is kind of quite easy from, from these formulas. Um, and um, Yes, that's probably true. Yes, thank you, Bjorn. Yes, in this case, uh, you could easily see that this surface is rational and just solve for T. Uh, yeah, so you don't need magma machinery, I think, for this, this, for this case here. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, so, but in any case, either way, uh, once you found a parameterization like this, then you see that, um, Uh, you see that um, you can substitute this A, B, and C into, um, into the family of mine, into this, well, I lost it, uh, into this family here. Yeah, so C, I don't really care about. It's some sort of, uh, it's what solves, it, 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 what makes, it's a square root of this expression. But the A and B I do care about. So if I plug A to be this and B to be this, then I find a family like this of cubic equations, 
which is now they have square discriminant and the discriminant is you know c squared where i see this, this expression here uh, so i find now a um, family of c3 extensions uh, of QAB, and in fact, this family is generic in a sense that it covers every single uh, cubic extension, uh, Galois cubic extension of Q, which is easy to see because uh, every cubic extension of Q can be given by an equation like this. So it does correspond to a rational point on the surface. And because we found a um, birational isomorphism like this, we, we covered all rational points on the surface possibly with some, some exceptions, but I don't think in this case uh, they matter. Um, so this family here is what's called generic. It covers every single C3 extension of Q or in fact over any extension of Q. So um, this is um, sort of a nice baby example. And it turns out that this method works uh, in examples which are uh, much more interesting. So let me give you one such example. Uh, and look a little bit at the smallest groups for which um, for which the inverse Galois problem is unknown over Q of T, uh, because we've talked a lot about uh, methods which, which allow you to go this far. So uh, if you've looked at the list of semi-abelian groups uh, uh, of order less than 64, you would have found that there are, I forgot I mentioned last time, I think six exceptions, one of them is A5, which we know how to do over Q of T by Hilbert, and the other all relates to SL2F3. And it turns out that once you can construct SL2F3 by again fiddling with split extensions, uh, which you can now do for that family, you can construct the other groups there uh, as well. So the smallest groups, which are not known to be Galois groups uh, with regularizations over Q of T, are groups of order 64. So again, if you've ever generated this list of non-semi-abelian groups, you'd find that there are 10 groups of order 64, which are not semi-abelian. So in a small group database, there's over 250, I think, groups of order 64. It's a long list, but there is 10 of them with numbers 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, 41, 42, 43, uh, that, um, that turn out to be non-semi-abelian. Uh, to answer, I mean, all, all the question, is there any indication when a family will be generic? Um, not as far as I know. So, I mean, uh, there are quite a few papers where people prove that certain families are generic, but they always, like in my case, essentially kind of generic by construction, rather than you first construct a family and then you try to figure out whether it's generic. So I do not know, um, I do not know an answer to this. So just looking at a family, to decide that it covers every single extension of with that Galois group. Um, I, I don't know of any such results, to be honest. Okay, so there are 10 groups of order 64, which are not semi-abelian, in other words, which we don't know how to construct over Q of T. And now um, groups, uh, they're all nilpotent, and the nilpotent groups are classified by what's called the nilpotency class, how, um, uh, the length of its central series. If you take uh, the center of a group and if you divide by the center, you take the center of a group again and so on until, um, until you exhaust the whole group, which you can always do in a nilpotent group. Uh, I mentioned very briefly there is a result by Thompson that every group from nilpotency class two is semi abelian. Uh, and of these 10, uh, seven are, uh, have nilpotency class three and three have nilpotency class four. And there's a paper by Leila Schnapps where she proves uh, by extending this semi-abelian, um, no, sorry, by looking, uh, by studying the abstractions in this case uh, of, of various lifting problems, she proves that the nilpotency class three groups, so these seven, they in fact have uh, realizations of Q of T. So the three groups, which as far as I know, are not known to be realizable over Q of T, uh, are these three, uh, the small group of 64 comma 41, 42, and 43. Let me just call them G1, G2, and G3. Uh, and um, it turns out that for at least one of them, this descent method works, even though um, it's reasonably convoluted because you do need to have quite a few steps in it. Uh, and you can construct a family for the first one of these three groups using this method. So you look, you look at G1, small group of 6441, 
uh, then it's a transitive group of 60 points, number 156. It's a group of order 64, and it sits as, the, as a maximal subgroup of some group of order 128, which sits in a maximal subgroup of specific group of order 256, 512, 1024, of which the last one, this particular group of order 1024, still acting on 16 points, turns out to be a nice semi direct product, which you can construct very easily. You can construct lots of families for this group. Uh, using just resultants. Of, um, it's essentially a reef product kind of group. Uh, and then you can do this descent. So you can construct a family for this group. And then you can ask yourself, uh, can you find, uh, can you descend to a subgroup of index two? Turns out that you can. Uh, can you descend again? Turns out that you can. Can you descend again? Turns out that you can. And finally to the group G1. Um, along the way, you get some rational curves or rational uh, surfaces, and in all cases, they have rational parameterizations, there are no local obstructions, and you can construct a family uh, for this group G1. Uh, G2 is very similar, uh, except that uh, I haven't been able yet to construct, to find a family for this group here, the top group on top, which I would be able to do this set all the way. I can only get up to the last step, up to here, but not up to this specific group. And the third group, G3, it only acts on 32 points rather than 16 which makes the whole thing just a little bit more cumbersome. So in any case, what I just want to say about this descent method is that it does seem to be very powerful in practice. So it has been very helpful to construct a lot of groups uh, and especially nice families for a lot of groups that haven't been uh, known before. But it is, I find it very difficult to analyze theoretically. That is to say, if I start with a group and I start with a subgroup or even a maximum subgroup, somehow predicting in advance that this descent is or is not going to be possible, whether you will end up uh, running into local obstructions or not, um, I do not know sort of methods for, uh, for doing that. So it's a little bit hard to, uh, as far as I'm aware, to prove theoretical results with this, with this method. Uh, that would be, I think, very interesting if one could do something like this. Uh, rather than you know just do it group by group, family by family, where you can do this, but um, it's hard to do it kind of on some sort of general basis. So to predict at least some situations when it works, I think that would be quite amazing. Okay, so that's I think all I want to say about this descent thing, and uh, except that as I said, it does work very nicely in practice. And uh, I gave again one exercise how to construct. Um, in fact, the generic family for quaternion groups using this method here, where you need to do a descent through a del Pezzo surface of degree four and parameterizing. It's a very nice example. Okay, and finally, the last method that I would like to talk about, it's called rigidity. It's a very powerful method, which is um, on the opposite spectrum of what we've looked so far. We've mostly looked at soluble groups, uh, and this method applies mostly to simple groups or groups, or groups which are very close to simple. So let me, there are many variants of it. People did try to push it uh, quite far, even though I think the work there is certainly not exhaustive. And I'm sure you can do more with it. But let me at least state some of the basic versions of the rigidity method. So first of all, let us start with something that's called the Riemann existence theorem, which, as again, I briefly mentioned before, it settles the inverse Galois problem of the C of T. And there are analogs by Harbater and Pop uh, and various other people who replace C here by a complete field. But uh, over C, this is a very classical and very strong result due to Riemann. It says the following, suppose you have a finite group and you pick uh, any number uh, any generators of G that you want, which multiply to one. So you pick elements G1 up to GL and G, completely arbitrary, with the only condition here that G1 times G2 times and so on GLs, so just in this order, is equal to one. And then uh, you take arbitrary L, so it's the same L as this number of element, points uh, on a projective line, so distinct points P1 up to PL. And then the Riemann existence theorem tells you that there exists a Galois cover of P1. So in other words, this is the compact Riemann surface, which maps to P1, uh, which has G, uh, this group here, acting on it as an automorphism group, such that uh, if you take the quotient 
uh, of this group by uh, of this Riemann surface by G, you get P1. So in other words, you get a map from X to P1 such that um, so uh, G acts faithfully. So most points they have exactly uh, the order of G pre-images, and such points are called unredified, except finitely many points where this is not true. And these points, um, over these points, you say that the map phi is ramified. So, uh, and the ramification locus is uh, exactly these points P1 up to PL here, at least assuming the GIs are not an entity. Um, and so, in other words, this Galois cover here is unramified outside this finite set of points S. Uh, and associated to every ramified point is what's called a ramification group. It's exactly the same as ramification groups you see in number theory. Uh, if you think of a cover of uh, curves like this in terms of their fields of rational functions, it gives you a Galois extension of fields of rational functions um, where uh, you know, it goes the other way. So um, the field of rational functions here is just Q of T, and you embed it into a larger field, which has Galois group G over Q of T, sorry, C of T. I'm working with the complex numbers. I have to remember that. Uh, so C of T here, and a finite extension is Galois group G here. And um, points of P1, are uh, you think of pl as, as places of that field of rational functions, and the ramification is the usual notion of ramification, and the ramification group is the usual notion of a ramification group, except that here the residue field the complex number is algebraic and closed. So this group here is always cyclic. Uh, and uh, so what Riemann existence uh, says is that you want this cover to be unramified outside S and exactly have prescribed ramification groups. So ramification group over PI is uh, generated by uh, GI. Or to be precise, um, Ramification group is only defined up to conjugacy because if you take a different point over PI, you get a conjugate group, but one of these conjugates is exactly the group generated by GI. So it's an extremely powerful statement. And in particular, it tells you that the inverse Galois problem is very much true uh, over C of T uh, because, so let's just prove this. Um, in other words, every finite group has a regular realization of C of T. So you take any group G, you take any generators which multiply to one. So for example, you take any generators of G, call them G1 up to GL minus one, and then you define GL to be the inverse of G1, GL minus one, is supposed to be inverse, so that the product is equal to one. Uh, and well, you apply Riemann existence theorem. So you take completely arbitrary points P1 up to PL, you can take any choice you wish. Uh, and then by Riemann existence, you find uh, a cover like this phi, uh, with Galois group G, which again by Galois theory corresponds to a field extension where the bottom field is C of T, the field of rational functions of P1, and the top field, uh, the field of rational functions of this curve X, uh, has Galois group G over it. And of course, it's automatically regular because the field of constants here is algebraically closed. So um, there are no algebraic elements in this field over C, except C itself. So that's it. So over C of T, you can construct covers like this, and there's a lot of choice involved. And the problem is descending from C to Q, because uh, in general, you can write down some sort of variety, which is called Hurwitz scheme, or when it's one dimensional Hurwitz curve, which parametrizes things like this, which parametrizes covers with a specific group and specific ramification data. But these varieties are difficult to compute, difficult to understand, and so on. And uh, they don't necessarily have rational points. So uh, the problem really is to somehow get from here to the rational numbers and to do the same sort of thing, but over Q of T. Uh, and uh, the trick is uh, there is a general principle sort of a number theory and Galois theory that you can construct any sort of object over the complex numbers, which is unique, then just uniqueness forces it to be defined over the rationals basically because if it wasn't defined over rationals, you could hit it by Galois and find another object like this. But now if it's unique, then it's not possible. Of course, this is more uh, philosophy than, uh, than a theorem, but it very often works and it works here in, this, in the same, uh, in the same uh, way. So generally the covers which are given by this theorem are not unique. There's a lot of choice involved, there's choices of these points PI, choices of these GIs, uh, um, and so on. And 
but you can what's called rigidified by putting enough conditions uh, on these conjugacy classes, so on these on this GIs and selecting PIs, sort of fixing them to be certain rational points in such a way that this cover uh, can be proved then to be unique and then it uh, can also be proved to be defined over Q. So that's, a, that's what this rigidity method does. So this is how it works. So suppose G is a finite group uh, and you pick L, it's the same L as before, as I had these elements G1 up to GL. You pick L conjugacy classes, so let's say you fix them, let's call them C1 up to CL, so conjugacy classes of G. And then you look at, well, basically what we're looking up there, the set of L tuples of elements G1 up to GL, where GI uh, are, each lies in the corresponding conjugacy class CI, and their product is one, so G1, G2 up to GL is equal to one, and they generate the whole group. So uh, the group generated by G1 up to GL is equal to G. Now, uh, if you just pick group at random and conjugacy class at random, this set may be empty because, for example, you could just say, I want all my CI to be identity. Well, sure, you can, but then they are never going to generate the whole group. So these conditions here may be sort of mutually exclusive, but um, whatever this set is, uh, let's say, assume for the moment it's not empty, G acts on it by conjugation because you can take an element little g in g and then conjugate all the gi by g. And then um, you'll see that these conditions are going to be preserved. Conjugacy classes, of course, are preserved by conjugation. This product will still be one if you put here g and g inverses everywhere. Uh, and, and they will still generate the whole group uh, g because well, essentially they generate a conjugate of g inside g. So in terms of Riemann surfaces, what this conjugation does, uh, it actually produces an isomorphic Riemann surface. So, uh, okay. So, uh, and uh, normally this group, will, uh, this group G will act freely on it by conjugation. So in other words, um, no, all elements except identity are not going to have any fixed points. Um, so let's, let's look at this condition a little bit. So if G, little g has a fixed point on sigma, so in other words, suppose you have such a tuple G1 up to GL that you conjugate by G and you find exactly the same tuple. So again, G acts on the tuples by conjugation. So it means that G conjugates G1 to G1, G2 to G2 and so on. So in other words, G commutes with all the GIs. But because GIs generate the whole group, uh, G commutes with the whole group. And that means that G is in the center of G. So this condition is just, so uh, having fixed points equivalent to being in the center. So from now on, uh, when we're going to talk about this rigidity method, uh, we're going to assume that the center of G is trivial. And as I mentioned before in the, one of the first lectures, this rigidity is a powerful method. It applies to a lot of interesting groups like the monster groups, but it certainly is restrictive. And for example, it never applies to groups such as nilpotent groups because of this condition, the center has to be trivial. So then the action G on sigma is free. So it's just a union of orbits, which are just regular orbits. Each one is sort of like a little copy of G. And we say that this tuple C1 up to CL is a rigid L tuple of conjugacy classes. If the size of this set, well, it's not empty, but otherwise than that, it's as small as possible. So the size of this set sigma is exactly the, the order of G. Equivalently, uh, you have only one orbit. The action of G on sigma is transitive. So every such tuple, can be obtained from every other such tuple by conjugation by G. So this is the setup. Uh, so this is the most important definition here. So think about it like this, you have a group, you have a bunch of conjugacy classes, you compute you know, the order of this set. And if it turns out to be order of G, then you're like, okay, great. This is a tuple to which rigidity method at least in some form is probably going to apply. Uh, and a second condition, which you have to uh, impose in some form or other to make um, the resulting family defined over Q is what's called rationality for conjugacy classes. So uh, it's also even easier to define. So if you've got a conjugacy class in G, it's called rational. If it has the following property, um, you take an element in that conjugacy class and you raise it to a power uh, which is co-prime to the order of G. So for example, you take the conjugacy class of elements of order three, then you take an element there and then you square it. 
or you raise to the power four or power five, anything co-prime to three, because you don't want to get identity or something, which is in a smaller conjugate class, but something co-prime to the order of G. And then the condition is, conjugate class is rational, is that you always end up with the same class. So for any element G in the conjugate class and any power which is co-prime to the order of G, this uh, power here lies again in the same conjugate class. So there are some examples of groups, which are called rational groups, in fact, where every conjugate class is rational, and the most famous of them is the symmetric group Sn. So if you take G to be Sn, then uh, its conjugate class to the to cycle types. So for instance, in S4, you have a cycle type four cycles, three cycles, double transpositions, and so on. And our cycle type is unchanged under this operation here. If you take, I don't know, a four cycle, and you raise it to the power of three, anything co-prime to four, then it's that it stays a, a four cycle. So uh, you end up in exactly the same conjugacy class. And that means that every conjugacy class in SN is rational. So SN is one of these groups to which this rigidity applies quite nicely, except we don't particularly care because constructing SN extensions is not very exciting. You just take an arbitrary polynomial, you will get an SN extension more or less. So this is not a very interesting group from our perspective, but nevertheless, it illustrates at least its definition of rational conjugacy classes. And to give an example of a non-rational uh, conjugacy class and what sort of more typically happens, let's take the smallest group, which is not an SN really, a uh, cyclic group of order three. So it, it has three elements, one G and G squared. And because the group is abelian, every element is its own conjugacy class. So this group has three conjugacy classes, identity, G and G squared. And of course you see already here that when you take an element and you square it, and that's an operation which is allowed, it's co-prime to three, it's to the order of the, um, of the element, then you end up in a different class. So you've got three classes, one G and G squared, and this operation of squaring an element, it has a property that this identity uh, class is definitely always going to be preserved, but the G, these classes G and G squared are going to be swapped. So uh, this is an example of a group where not every conjugacy class is rational. And um, the reason here I draw a character table for this group is that there is a very nice a little lemma uh, which says that a conjugacy class is rational if and only if, uh, from the point of view of character theory, every irreducible character takes a rational value on it. So you can always spot them in the character table. If you look at the character table of a specific group, you just look at the table where all entries are integers, because they're algebraic integers, if they're rational, they're automatically integers. And if you find such a column, then you've got yourself a rational conjugacy class. And if not, then it's not. And like here, uh, the operation of squaring or cubic or whatever an element will swap it with some other class and you can see which ones they are again by looking at the character table. So in this case, for example, if you look at this character table, complex conjugation swaps zeta three and zeta three squared and it, so it swaps these two columns uh, and uh, it, it tells you that these two classes are not rational. And more generally, uh, this operation, if you want, by taking a conjugacy class associating to it uh, the corresponding column in the character table and hitting it by Galois defines a Galois action on the set of conjugacy classes, which factors to some abelian extension of Q. It's a reasonably simple uh, kind of uh, action, but it's not always trivial. Okay, so, and now uh, with this notion of rational conjugacy classes, we can state uh, the first rigidity theorem uh, which is usually referred to as basic rigidity theorem and um, combined work of a variety of people, so Bailey, Fried, Matsat, Sheep, and Thompson. Uh, it says the following, suppose you've got a rigid L tuple of rational conjugacy classes. So here there are two conditions. I've got a group G, trivial center, so three conditions. First condition is trivial center. Secondly, uh, I take a tuple of conjugacy classes which are all rational. And thirdly, I want to be rigid in the sense that I described. So if you do this column of elements, little g i in here, which, multi uh, which multiply to one, the number you get is non-zero, but otherwise small as possible, equal to the order of g. Take p1, pl to be arbitrary, but now rational points on p1. Uh, then there exists, and uh, 
in fact, it exists unique, which, which is this, its uniqueness, which forces it to be over Q, really. There exists a unique regular G covering from X to P1 over Q, uh, which is like in the Riemann existence theorem, except now uh, this is a curve defined over Q. This covering here is defined over Q. It's still unramified outside P1, PL, uh, and the inertia group at PI is generated by an element uh, of this conjugacy class CI. So this is a nice theorem. It doesn't often apply because, uh, well, there are two conditions, rigidity and rationality. Uh, rigidity is kind of, well, you have to have it, otherwise um, uh, there, there, is no, there is no hope, but rationality that we, what we uh, asked for is a little too strong for applications. There are just not many groups to which this applies. So there's a variant which, um, um, I think is due to Sarah really in this combination, in this uh, formulation that uh, says almost the same, but it weakens rationality a little bit in an obvious way. It says, well, suppose you have a, a rigid tuple again of conjugacy classes C1 and 2CL, but we don't want every class to be rational. We have an action of Galois Q bar over Q on, on this set, and we just want it to be Galois stable. So in other words, like in this example, if I took this conjugacy class and this conjugacy class, then although these two conjugacy classes are not rational, Galois permutes them, it's sort of like these divisors. A rational divisor consists of points such that the whole thing is Galois stable, but the points are not necessarily defined over Q. It's exactly the same thing here. Uh, if you take these two classes, then they are not rational, but they form a Galois stable set. And then you take the points PI in a projective line, which are now not rational, but uh, which are, you know, which correspond to this action, and that's always easy and possible to do. So you choose points P1 up to PL, now points in P1 Q bar, which are anti-isomorphic as a Galois set to this set C1 up to CL. Uh, and then uh, there exists exactly as before, a regular G covering, which you can make unique once you sort of say carefully, uh, state carefully what happens with inertia groups. Um, again, covering defined over Q, unramified outside P1, PL, and which has inertia at PI generated by an element of CI. It's just a slightly less restrictive condition uh, of rationality. And uh, this now applies to a few interesting groups, though not so many still. Uh, and a lot of work by people like Matsat, Thompson, who pushed it to sporadic groups and so on. They looked at various variants and you know, pushed this theorem further to uh, write down specific variants for specific groups which work in their context and again guarantee the existence of such a covering. But these methods sort of look a bit ad hoc, which you can do if you are dealing with 25 sporadic groups because there's only 25 of them. Uh, but um, I don't know of a, like a very clean general result, which is more general than this. Okay, so in the last, what is it, seven minutes, let me just finish with an example of an interesting group to which this rigidity applies. So uh, the group here is a second simple group uh, that there is. We've already dealt with A5. That's a smaller simple group, a non-abelian simple group of order 60. The next non-abelian group is order 168, and it's PSL 2 F7 or GL3 F2, the same group. And here is its conjugacy classes and a character table. So it has six conjugacy classes, six irreducible characters. Elements are of order one, two, three, four, and two conjugacy classes of size seven, uh, uh, sorry, of elements of order seven. And I wrote the sizes here of conjugacy classes, and I wrote the six irreducible characters and the character table. Uh, and you see here immediately from this table that these four classes are rational uh, and these two classes are not. They're permuted by Galois, as you can see by these numbers here, which are permuted by Galois, which are not rational numbers. Okay, so now uh, what we can do, uh, we can find a rigid uh, tuple uh, of conjugacy classes. Uh, and what, I mean, this is such a small group that you can just write a code, you know, which goes through elements in these classes and just find tuples which multiplies to one. It's not very hard to do and it, the process will terminate very quickly. 
in large groups, it's harder to do, but there's a very nice neat formula that allows to count in any group L tuples of elements such as GI lies in CI, where CI are given conjugacy classes and which multiply to one, exactly the thing that we want, except the condition that GI generate the whole group. But the formula is very, very nice. It's given in terms of characters. It says that in any group G and conjugacy classes C1 up to CL, if you are interested in the number of elements, so L tuples, GI in that class CI, whose product is equal to one, then the number is equal to one of the order of G times the product of the size of these conjugacy classes. And then there is a sum over irreducible characters of the values of that character, like here are the values of irreducible characters of various classes on the class, you know, C1 up to CL multiplied together and then divided by the dimension of chi to the power L minus two. This is a very, I mean, it looks maybe a little convoluted, but because character tables are you know, easy to compute normally for even large simple groups, uh, this gives a very efficient way to find these things. So in this group, PSL2 and seven, there are three classes which I sort of try to mark with bold, which is these guys, element of order three, and the two classes of order seven. So again, this is a collection of, uh, so C3, C5, and C6, that's going to be my triple of conjugacy classes. And uh, these two are not rational, but the whole collection is defined over Q. So the Galois group over Q permutes these two. Uh, so this is a, a rational in the sense of Sarah's or Galois stable uh, triple of conjugacy classes. And what we're going to check, we're going to check that this is a rigid triple. So first, uh, let's apply this formula here and count the number of triples of elements, element in this class, so element for the three in this group, element for the seven in this group, another element for the seven in this group, uh, such which is in different conjugates class, which all multiply to one. Uh, and this number is given by this formula here. So you can just compute it. You don't even need to compute an algebra system for this. So it's one over the order of group, which is 168, times the product of the sizes of conjugacy classes, which are 56, 24, and 24. Easy to see if you compute uh, this or centralize this of various elements. Uh, sorry, I lost my page by pressing something. Yeah, there it is again. And then you need this sum over the characters, the values. So you go through all the characters. Uh, and then you look at these values on this class, multiplied by the value on this class, multiplied by the value on this class. And now, of course, there's lots of zeros in my table. So for these characters, row two, row three, row four, and row five, the product value here times value here times value here is going to be zero. So and actually, it's only two characters that are relevant, which is this one and that one, where the values are non-zero. So what you find is 168 times 56, 24, 24, and then one times one times one with a trivial character divided by one, the dimension of chi. And then for this last character here, minus one times one times one divided by the dimension of a chi to the power, my L is three, so to the power one, so over eight. So this is seven eighths, I guess, one minus one eighths. So you multiply one over three times seven times eight by seven by eight by three by eight by three by eight and by seven eighths. And if you do that, you see that uh, one of the sevens cancels, one of the eights cancels, and one of the threes cancels, and you find that you get 168, which is the order of the group. So in other words, uh, the number of triples which satisfy this condition, there is exactly 168 of them. And it turns out that every such triple automatically generates G. Um, I don't know, a very quick way to see this, uh, but one way to see this, for example, is just to look at this group, just find one triple of elements like this, which does generate G. Just find one example by hand. And then once you know that there is one example, we know that there is 168 of them, because remember again, the set of elements which generate G, they form a union of regular orbits. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, you know that all of these 162 triples have this property. And therefore, this triple is rigid. Um, you could probably do something a little bit better by proving that um, you know two of these elements already generating 
group of order 21, at least, element of order three and element of order seven, if you could just prove that this group has larger order, then um, it will be enough to prove that it's a whole group. Uh, but I'm not sure, uh, I'm not entirely sure how to, how to finish off this argument. Uh, so in any case, it's easy to find an example. It's a small group. And then you find that this triple is therefore rigid. And by the rigidity theorem, therefore, this is a Galois group of Q of T. So this example is, uh, I mean, by itself, it's maybe not super interesting because I left as an exercise to prove that uh, for some reason that I don't exactly know, it's very easy to realize this group of Q of T anyway. You look at LMFDB, you look at a bunch of fields there uh, which have PSL 2F7 group, uh, there's lots of them. And by just basically interpolating them, uh, as I did there as a, in an exercise, you find lots and lots of one parameter families, and you can in fact push it to two, three, or even four parameter families. That's a paper of Male, which does this. So this group is, is actually quite easy to construct over Q of T, but rigidity applies to a lot of other groups where this is certainly not the case. And generally, just to give a last comment on PSL 2F7, so Schick has proved a, a theorem using a different method, which involves modular forms and modular curves, that PSL 2FP is a Galois group over Q whenever two or three or seven is a quadratic non-residue modular P. And this particular, in particular, it covers PSL 2F7. So what we just did is basically we proved one simple case of, um, of his result. But there are many other methods, and especially for the other groups, especially sporadic simple groups, where it's only using rigidity that we know uh, how to construct uh, how to construct these groups. So generally, it's a very powerful method, and it complements a lot of things that we've done so far, which mostly applies to solid groups. Okay, I think I exactly run out of time, so this is in a good place to stop for me. Thank you very much. Okay, let's thank Tim both for that lecture and for all his lectures. We're a little past 10, but I, I think there's a break before the next problem session. So I, I, I think we have time for questions. Are there modifications to the rigidity results if Z of G is non-trivial? Uh, that's a very good question. So I think um, I've seen several. So I've seen one paper where, uh, I think it's a book on Mali and Matsat who say that it's, um, you don't need a center to be trivial, you need it to have a complement with the group. So a subgroup, which together with the center generates the whole group and which have a trivial intersection. But as somebody else remarks in a different paper, that means that your group is a direct product by the center of something else, uh, in a smaller group. And in a smaller group, you, can st you still have rigidity. So in fact, it doesn't add anything interesting. Uh, so, to answer your question, I do not know personally of any modification, which is interesting in a sense that it would allow you to do more groups than you could do otherwise with this rigidity method. So it seems somehow a bit of a fundamental issue with this method because of the action of the group by conjugation and the fact that the center is just invisible. Other questions? Uh, could I ask a question? Please. Yes, I heard there was a question. No, oh, probably. yeah. Um, so I had a question. So part of the problem is this variety, which has a map to P1. Um, it needs to be defined over Q. Um, yeah. So sorry for the noise, but is there any connection with uh, Galois descent in this context? Well, certainly in a sense that what we are trying to do here is you know, Galois descent, you could, we are trying to, um, we start with a curve over C, or more generally, as I mentioned, there is a theory of Hurwitz schemes and Hurwitz curves, where you try to understand all covers which have this property, and then to descend the corresponding scheme to Q, or uh, find it, and then after that, find its rational points. So this is, I think, a special case of Galois descent. And in fact, I think, the proof in Serre's book, Topics in Galois Theory, of uh, this basic rigidity theorem, 
uh, it's, you know, it's very much sort of Galois descent, like it uses arithmetic fundamental group and uh, it's, it's very much in that flavor. And I think he, he even mentions connections to, to Galois descent theorems in there. Okay, thank you. And there was a question, what is the status of PSL2FP? Uh, yes, by now it's known uh, for all primes. So Sheikh proved it under these conditions of two, three, and seven uh, being quadratic non-residue. And then it was extended, I think, by Matsat to and five as a quadratic non-residue. Uh, and, um, and by now it is, it is completely settled. But I think it is, apart from the alternating groups, it's possibly the only family, my like complete family of simple groups for which um, uh, for which it is known, for which you know that these groups are known to be realizable over Q of T. There's also the work of uh, Ji Wei Yun that did some exceptional groups. I think G two of G two of F P and E eight of F P. But I guess those are yeah. I think they're ah, okay. Simple. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank uh, Tim again for all of his nice lectures.